Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. The California State Legislature will soon receive California's task force to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. The commission spent two years investigating and analyzing racial gaps in health, wealth, housing, education, and employment that affect black Californians. Some of the task force's recommendations include investing in black communities, black businesses, education, police reform, and other such things. It also includes a recommendation for direct cash payments to black Californians that reportedly could be potentially as high as $1.2 million for each person. Some of these recommendations could be turned into bills as early as the end of the month. Governor Gavin Newsom, who supported creating the commission, said in a recent statement that, quote, dealing with that legacy is about much more than cash payments. Don't know exactly what that means. However, uh, he has yet to endorse or even oppose any of the recommendations. He says he will wait until the report is officially uh, handed to the state legislature. The direct cash payment, again, which is just one of many proposals, could cost the state some $800 billion. Well, today we're going to be in conversation about reparations, its history, what's happening right now, and its future. My guest for this is William A. Darity Jr. and A. Kirsten Mullen. William A. Darity Jr. is a Samuel Du Bois Cook Professor of Public Policy, African and American African American Studies and Economics, and founding director of the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. And A. Kirsten Mullen is an independent scholar. She's also a folklorist and founder of Artifactual, which is an art consulting practice, and Carolina Circuit Writers, a literary consortium that brings expressive writers of color to the Carolinas. Together, they are both contributors and editors of the book called the Black Reparations Project, a handbook for racial justice. It is a product of the Black Reparations Project, which represents the collective work of the Reparations Planning Committee, which is a group of about 20 scholars. Kristen Mullen and William Darity, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you both to this program. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you very thanks much. for having us. I should say from the right from the beginning, you, you've you've worked as consultants uh, to this California commission that has studied for represent, uh, re- reparations. So we'll, we'll we'll see if that puts you in a funny spot in in talking about it. But um, you know what what the thing that stands out to people is one point two million dollar cash payments um, to to individuals. Does is, should that be seen as high or should that be seen as about right? Um, Let me say first, we're pro bono consultants to the California Department of Justice and to the Reparations Task Force. Um, I I think the the question should probably be different, (laughs) not whether or not $1.2 million is high or low, but does the state of California have the capacity to pay a reparations bill of that size? Um, You know, for, for us, the culpable and the capable party for paying reparations to Black Americans since the U.S. slavery is the federal government. Um, you know, we don't believe that states and municipalities uh, should be uh, taxed, you know, should be on the hook for these these payments. Um, they, they can't afford to pay them. Uh, their budgets are too small. And, you know, we also believe that the federal government is the responsible party and that they should pay the bill, not states and municipalities. Yeah, the uh, total budget, I think, for the state of California is in the vicinity of $300 billion. Mm -hmm. Uh, The amounts that we have seen put forward as overall calculations of what might be paid on the basis of the tentative report that the task force has put forward uh have ranged from 200 billion dollars to 800 billion dollars um i i've seen folks say that it would be feasible for the state to pay it if it did so over a long period of time uh i've even seen uh the organization called liberation ventures propose that it might be 50 years uh and they talk about a 500 billion dollar figure but if you uh, if you were to to distribute that equally in real dollars over a fifty year period, you're talking about a ten billion dollar expenditure per annum, and uh, I, I, and that would mean uh, very very small payments to individuals on an annual basis. Uh, I don't think they would be transformative. So uh, it's it's just very very difficult for states and localities to meet an expense of this type. Uh, I think I think that the calculation of the total budgets for all state and local governments in the United States 
uh, and that's eight, 108,000 towns and cities, right. maybe, and 50 states, comes to uh, less than $5 trillion. Uh, and our focus is on uh, an objective of eliminating the racial wealth gap in the United States. And we, we can talk a bit more about why that's our, our focus. But we estimate that that would require at least $14 trillion in expenditure. Uh, and so there's just absolutely no way in which the states and local governments could could meet that bill. Do, do you feel the, the states and local governments, because there's other local governments that are, are also exploring expo, uh, reparations. Do, do you feel as though that takes away from the push of getting the federal government to do reparations or or maybe the federal I mean, government? Our, yeah. I mean, that's our view when I mean, we don't know for a fact, but. You know, we can imagine a, a scenario in which people would say, you know, opponents of reparations would say, well, you've got this project in California, you've got this project in, Il in Illinois, you have the, the housing voucher program in Evanston, you don't need a national program. But as Sandy said, you know, there are over 108,000 cities in the United States, are all of them going to enact some kind of reparations program? Uh, and already, you know, when you're looking at the two dozen or so programs that are that are in motion, they're not identical. Um, you know, what they're calling reparations varies greatly. Um, you know, some of them are talking about, as, as I mentioned, Evanston, Illinois, a housing voucher program that is masquerading as reparations. Some of them are suggesting that um, funds be set aside to assist with the identification of historic structures that have significance for Black, black people. Um, they, they vary tremendously in terms of uh, you know, what their goals are and who they even target. Asheville, North Carolina, uh, for example, has a reparations project that took, that focuses on minorities, you know, not Black American descendants of U.S. slavery at all, not specifically. So, you know, we just don't feel that these projects are adequate in terms of their scope, and they absolutely are inadequate in terms of their budget because they're not designed. I don't know of a single one that's designed to eliminate the racial wealth gap, which for us is really essential to true reparations. I mean, there's a host of things that states and localities can do to make conditions better. Uh, but we don't think that they can collectively or individually do enough to meet the demands of elimination of the racial wealth gap in the United States. And uh, insofar as that's the case, we wish they would not call these types of initiatives reparations. Uh, you know, we'd be perfectly content if they said they were undertaking something that you might label a racial equity initiative. Uh, but there's a a certain presumptuousness associated with the use of the term reparations uh, because of its moral significance uh, and because of its historic significance in terms of the record of the United States of America. And so um, we wish that these piecemeal initiatives at the state and local level and even individual private actors uh, you know, would not would not claim that what they're doing is is okay. is is reparations. When, when you say private actors, do you mean sort of corporations that were involved in, in corporations slavery? Corporations or even individuals. Or colleges you know, and universities, universities or churches. Cultural institutions. Yes. Yeah. You're not against them doing doing certain actions, just you're against them calling it reparations. Is right. that right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean it's an important point. What what is reparations? When we have the national dialogue over reparations, we we talk about it in many ways, and and in one way we talk about it is well, reparations should be greater investment in Black communities and education, and actually many of these recommendations that the 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 commission in California came up with. But but what for you is reparations? I mean, well, I mean, you know, we're talking about acknowledgement, um, redress. redress, and closure, you know, for a grievous injustice. Um, you know, uh, you know, for conveniently, you know, it's increased the synonym, synonym the acronym, the, the acronym ARC, A R C. So we're talking about, um, you know, in terms of acknowledgement, this is referring to the perpetrators of the harms or the atrocities, admitting that they were the culpable parties, right? And is that an um, apology? It would be I mean, an apology. apology, although you know we have had apologies already. 
Um, but we've not had apologies that were coupled with an admission of responsibility. responsibility. That's it's a and, declaration and that's of huge. responsibility. That's, that's huge. Crucial. And so this is where the restitution, you know, would come in. Um, but you know, so redress, you know, is that formal act of restitution? Um, you know, historically, um, members of victimized communities have been awarded monetary, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, prizes, monetary grants. Um, for that for those harms and we don't think that that should be any different today um you know this was certainly the case when um uh, the holocaust victims were um granted uh reparations this was a case when japanese americans were granted reparations uh for their unlawful internment in the united states and so we don't think it should be any different in the united states uh, it should this should be any different let me start that again we know that you know, reparations were paid to, you know, victims of the Holocaust. And and they continue to be paid, actually, uh, not only by Germany, but by the U.S. government, even though the U.S. government was not a perpetrator of those harms. The United um, States pays in the Holocaust well, reparations? I, I, I didn't know that. That is that is correct. Uh, and in fact, uh, they were increased to, o- during the period of COVID. Yeah, to, uh, to victims and, and to their, their descendants who yeah. are U.S. citizens. citizens. Yeah. Um, yeah. So many people are aware that the United States also, you know, has contributed to to, to those payments. Um, but 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 also, uh, the United States government's paid reparations to Japanese Americans who were uh, unlawfully interned in the United States. Um, you know, many people aren't aware that the U.S. government is also paying reparations to Americans who were held hostage in Tehran, Iran, in 1979, 80, um, and those what is it, 52. Um, hostages are receiving reparations from the U.S. government um, of $10,000 per day, per day of captivity. So that's about $4.4 million each. So we definitely have a precedent for it. Um, You know, people just begin to balk and drag their feet when the potential recipients of payments for atrocities and harms committed against them are Black Americans of U.S. slavery. So then lastly, you know, closure, um, you know, means that uh, the culpable party and the the party that was subjected to these atrocities and harms would agree that the terms for redress had been met. And the idea then would be that the, uh, the party, the victimized party would not bring any additional claims to the federal government, to the U.S. government, unless there is a renewal of some of the old harms uh, or new ones are inflicted upon them. A lot there I want to unpack. Let me begin with the apology. The United States has apologized for slavery, right, but, but been, without they, the they, other very, part. Yes, they're very careful not to acknowledge, uh, you know, responsibility for you know, Sandy mentioned, um, mm-hmm. you know, nearly 100 years of massacres that were directed at, you know, black people between Reconstruction and the end of World War II that, you know, that resulted not only in the loss of black lives, but the appropriation of black people's property, you know, which further increases the racial wealth gap. Yeah, um, the um, the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate have issued apologies uh, for slavery, but the uh, the Senate apology is specific in saying that this is not a commitment to provide any form of restitution, and uh, and 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 correspondingly. There is no statement of responsibility for the history of atrocities on the part of the United States government uh, in in either apology. So, um, you know, and 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 given the fact that that it is it's United States law that made slavery legal, it's United States law that made segregation legal for close to a century. Uh, it's United States law that introduced the Homestead Act of 1862 that gave uh, 160 acres of land to one and a half million white American families uh, in the latter part of the uh, 19th century and the first part of the 20th century. 
160 acre land grants where um, the uh, the social scientist Trina Williams Shanks estimates that there are now 45 million living white Americans who continue to be beneficiaries of these mm-hmm. land patents that were received. And at the same time, the federal government reneged on its commitment to provide 40 acre land grants to the newly emancipated. And so we argue that that's the beginning of the contemporary racial wealth divide between blacks and whites, the fact that the federal government gave a substantial asset in the form of land to a large number of white Americans. In fact, we estimate that somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 12 percent of the white population in the United States received uh, these land patents from the federal government. That was like 1.5 million white households yeah. at the time. And, 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 and then on the other hand, I think the, the, the upper bound estimate of the total number of black Americans, mm-hmm. not families, but individuals mm-hmm. who had access to some form of land patent from the federal government amounted to about 20,000 people uh, and that's out of 4 million individuals who were newly emancipated at the end of the Civil War. So less than 1%. Right. Yeah. Yeah, this, this Olmsted, comparing it, uh, reparations and the 40 acres to the Olmsted Act is pretty mind-blowing. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating to me that... Because the know, Olmsted Act happened evidently, after. Evidently, right? you, I certainly was not taught, you know, I was not introduced to those two things, those two federal policies side by side yeah. in, in high school or his or college classes. Uh, and yet, you know, they're they're right there together. 1862 was the Homestead Act and you've got emancipation of 1865. So, you know, I think I think I and many others would have had a very different um, kind of lens to, you know, to to examine all of this if we had understood those two policies, those two federal policies, you know, pretty coexisted and what the implications of those policies, you know, is today. I mean, you know, um, approximately 45 million white individuals are benefiting from that single government policy today. Um, you know, the last uh, land uh, patent was made in 1980. So, you know, that legislation carried for over a century. Um, I mean, it's just just extraordinary. You know, in one, um, you know, one uh, one data point, uh, this is uh, our colleague, uh, Jennifer Mueller. It's pretty dramatic data point. (laughs) Um, You know, asked her students at Texas A&M University to, you know, interrogate their family's wealth position to find out where did the money come from in your family? And I think many of the students had a story of, you know, this individual or that individual who was, you know, incredibly persevering or, um, you know, had some uh, innovation or a patent, um, you know, someone who, you know, put in a lot of sweat equity uh, and that's where the money came from. And while, you know, you know, we don't doubt that that was the case, um, you know, we would also say, you know, do some research and find out exactly, you know, when and how the federal government intervened on your family's behalf. So, uh, in fact, fully 25% of her students, about 150 students, found evidence of uh, a land grant. Um, and then an even higher percentage, you know, closer to like, but over 80% of them had evidence of GI bills, which they're, and in some cases, more than one in G- a single GI you know, bill benefits for to buy a house, house to buy you know, a home. Yeah. In, in many cases uh, they had more than one individual you know across their family who had been able to purchase uh, a home uh, as a consequence of support from the federal government um and zero zero non-white students had uh, a home set uh pat in her class well, so uh, oh, 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 but the yeah, example well, i was going to going to share was one <clears throat> excuse me well, one student whose family had been given land in the panhandle of texas that's a, at the, that sort of rectangle at the top it was 26 counties um in 1880 and you know this is land that they could you could live on the land you could subdivide the land you could lease it you could borrow against it um but any of the natural resources on the land were yours to use to sell um, you know, any 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 uh, any uh, woodlands could be plained as lumber. Uh, any any wildlife, uh, water rights, mineral rights, etc. Uh, they decided that they would lease the land 
So immediately they're receiving a revenue stream from this um, homestead property. property. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so sometime later, the patriarch dies and his widow decides to move with their eight children to Austin, Texas, to give the children a better opportunity uh, of going to college. So they move to Austin. Six of the eight um, receive college degrees, uh, debt-free because they can afford to pay for college. Um, then the matriarch dies and the eight children decide to continue to lease the land and split the profits eight ways. So moving forward to 1980, they still own the land and natural gas is discovered on the property. And the deposits are so rich that in the first year alone, the profits were over one hundred thousand dollars. So you have this example of this, you know, this individual family basically receiving, you know, free equity from the federal government. I mean, it's a handout. It's a free handout from the federal government. You know, we're not against uh, handouts, but we just think that they should be um, equitably dispersed. Um, and so this opportunity to have an asset that was provided by the federal government is something that white Americans have and that black Americans did not get. You know, never mind that the black uh, newly emancipated people were uh, promised 40 acres versus 160, but they didn't get the 40. Um, you know, they didn't have this opportunity to accumulate wealth over generations. And we know that's how wealth, you know, is created. It's not just, you know, what an individual can um, can amass in their lifetime. It's what did your parents, what did your grandparents or great grandparents amass and what did they pass down to you? This yeah, is I'd like to go back to Kirsten's comment about the uh, GI Bill. Yeah, interesting uh, link, right? From Homestead to GI Bill, because GI Bill is also well, during a time know, of government. redlining. Yeah. Right, right. You know, so you go from you know helping white people become uh, you know middle class and upper class with land acquisition, and then we switch to the acquisition of a home. But, yeah, yeah, that, and that's the big shift. The, the federal government's asset building program in the 19th century involved land distribution as it completed its colonial settler project in the Western territories. Uh, but in the 20th century, its asset building focus shifted to home ownership. Uh, but, you know, as Kirsten suggested, that was conducted in a highly discriminatory fashion. Uh, Initially, under the auspices of the New Deal, you had the introduction of the Federal Housing Administration, and it's the Federal Housing Administration in a public-private partnership with local banks that conducted the redlining scheme, which essentially starved Black potential homeowners from credit. And then uh, then the GI Bill is introduced uh, at, as, as a means of providing support to returning veterans after World War II, and the home buying provisions were executed in a highly discriminatory fashion so that you built a middle class in the United States dramatically from that piece of legislation, but you built a middle class that was, well, white middle class right. in the United right. States. And so, um, so again, you could think about this as another type of handout, yeah. if you will, yeah. Uh, but I mean, Ira, Katz, Ira Katz Nelson, sociologist, calls it affirmative action for white people. Yeah, you know he he looks at Mississippi uh, specifically, and um, with know, the New Deal, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. since 1949, um, something like 3,900 um, uh, benefits were made for white GIs. I'm sorry, we're, sorry, were made for GIs in the state. A little over 3,900. Two of those, two out of nearly 4,000 went to black GIs in the entire state. So, you know, it wasn't even, you know, it, it, it's not even, comp, you know, it's not even close. Um, no. The kinds of benefits, uh, opportunities and, that were made available for black people. And the Northern story is the not, story is not much, much better. better right? the, the, the numbers are much higher, you know, closer to 100,000 uh, white GIs uh, in 1949. But the number of you know non-white GIs is closer to one thousand. So you're still talking about one percent or less than one percent. Actually, it's, it's less than that in Mississippi. Yeah. So yeah. This is letters well, and politics, and it's we like are presented to one percent in Mississippi. It's, it's negligible yeah. in Mississippi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Let, let me yeah. let everyone know who we're talking to. This is Letters and Politics, and today we are in conversation with William Darity Jr. and A. Kirsten Molin. Together, they are both editors and contributors to a book called The Black Reparations Project, a handbook for racial justice. Let me let me dive in history now and ask about the promise of 40 acres. Oftentimes we hear it as 40 acres and a mule. I'll let you clarify if that's what it actually was. Where, where does this promise come from? So this is part of uh, General Sherman, William Sherman's special field order number 15. Um, you know, the, the mule, which is not specified in the order, um, but we referred to, you know, a farming animal, you know, um, you know, in fact, uh, what was discussed uh, in the correspondence, uh, in federal correspondence was, you know, seeds, um, you know, tools, but they are not specified in the field order itself. So this was land that had been formally uh, owned by the, the, the Confederates. Uh, you're talking about a 30 mile swath of land that stretched from the, the sea islands of South Carolina all the way across to the St. John's River in Florida. Um, you know, this is land that uh, would have been, you know, occupied, you know, public, ex you know, exclusively by black people. So this would have been the moment when, you know, black people would have had, um, you know, an opportunity to become, full, you know, full citizens in the United States. Um, you know, if they had been um, protected by, uh, you know, allowed to have these these uh, 40 acre land and then it was like a, a maximum of 40 acres, uh, everyone uh, probably would not have received the, the full well, 40 acres. Well, the Homestead Act said a maximum of 160. Uh, so, a lot of so it was kind of did. implicitly understood that you'd get that amount. But uh, that was not necessarily the case. Well, no, no. Uh, under Sherman's order. Yes. The initial allocation that was made was 400,000 acres, acres to 40,000 right. individuals, which is 10 acres per people. person. That's, and if you yeah, think about 40. a family being approximately four so people, your, that's, how the 40 that's, acres that's your, they, 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 they were getting 40 acres, yeah. but, uh, but the, the total amount of land that was designated under special field much, orders, number much 15, higher was 5.3 million acres. Yeah, there's a so, substantial. So it was only 400,000 acres that were allocated before Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor, after Lincoln was murdered. It was only 400,000 acres that had been allocated before Andrew Johnson reneged on the program right. and stopped it. And, and then and the land reverts back to the, 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 the ex-Confederates who had owned it you know, previously. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting, as Sandy mentioned uh, a bit earlier, the land that, uh, you know, the white homesteaders uh, were, were given was in the Western territories. So this is land that had just only recently been occupied by, inhabited by, you know, Native Americans. Um, so this helped, you know, this helped the nation, you know, complete its colonial settler project. Right. Um, yeah, but in in contrast, in contrast, we're talking about you know land that had been confiscated from or abandoned by the Confederates, the traitors. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, the traitors yeah. of the United States. Yeah, much more palatable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's, so so General Sherman comes up with this order. Of course, he's not a legislator. He's not a senator. He's not a representative. He's he's not in the executive department, uh, the executive branch no, of government. No, but he was following Lincoln's orders. Oh, he was. So this came from in Lincoln, inevitably. Yes. Oh. And in fact, uh, the federal government already had in place several experimental projects with black people living on uh, land that had been confiscated. One of those was in Port Royal, uh, South Carolina. And as early as 1861, while the uh, Civil War was being fought, Black people were settled on those lands and they were producing, you know, cotton, uh, rice, indigo, um, you know, and and selling their uh, goods to the federal government for fixed prices. And the research uh, on that on those experiments uh, reveals that they were wildly successful. I mean, you know, clearly black people knew something about farming. <laughs> you know, they've been at it for a while. And uh, and they knew something about the special crops that had been introduced uh, widely across the South. Um, these projects were profitable um, and the communities were thriving. So they knew 
that the experiment could work. You know, the question was, will the federal government provide this land, provide this asset to these black people as payment for hundreds of years of uncompensated labor? And nobody ever got anything. Uh, Johnson going back on the deal occurred before A few anyone- people did initially, mm-hmm. but they were, you know, for the most part made to give the land back, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and in some cases, you know, people had, you know, if they had managed to accumulate some savings and purchased seed or purchased um, agricultural implements or farm animals, they lost all of that. You know, the federal government did not reimburse them for any expenses they had incurred. Yeah, well, you know, as we said a little bit earlier that uh, the total number of black Americans who receive land grants from the federal government, uh, the the maximum estimate is approximately 20,000 persons. Mm -hmm. And that's a combination of individuals who got land grants under the Southern Homestead Act, which succeeded the Homestead Act of 1862. Not a replacement, but a complement to it. But it only lasted less than a decade, yeah, six or seven years. And then there were some Black Americans who received land under the Homestead Act of 1862, primarily in Kansas. These are the individuals we refer to as the exodusters. So if you combine the folks who got land under the Southern Homestead Act with those who got some land under the Homestead Act, you get approximately uh, 20,000 people at the upper bound. Uh, and as we pointed out, that's 20,000 persons. Out of the, then the total number four, of persons who were em- emancipated were 4 million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would there be a movement for reparations after this in, in the early years after Johnson? Renee oh, absolutely. The absolutely. I mean, you know, you know, we, you know, understand that black people, you know, enslaved black people were the original abolitionists. You know, they were constantly, continuously trying to figure out how to um, to liberate themselves, how to get paid for the labor they were forced to um, to execute. Um, but you had, you know, formal organized efforts uh, very early as well. One of those um, was the Kelly House, who had been an enslaved person. Um, she was in Tennessee and, you know, woman did not have formal education, but she had attended one of the freedom schools. And, you know, one of the documents that they taught was, um, you know, the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. And, and she, you know, understood that to mean that the federal government exists to help the citizens. And her thinking was, you know, if white veterans are receiving pensions from the federal government for their time serving uh, in the union, why not black veterans? And so she uh, began organizing um, uh, the the mutual uh, beneficent uh, group that she uh, co-organizes, uh, eventually has a paid membership of over 300,000 individuals, mm-hmm. uh, probably more. That was the number that the federal government was aware of. Um, and they began to you know, organize and to write letters and to have rallies. Um, and, and then they were and then she was expanding, saying, you know, the federal government should pay pensions to uh, black people, the older black people who had been enslaved. So, um, you know, yes, she was very focused on this very early. So this would have been like the 19, no, so I'm 18, sorry, the 18, um, 1890s. 1890s. And um, so, but, you know, uh, even though uh, they also provided um, uh, sort of sick, uh, you know, sickness benefits uh, and, and, and funeral Benefit. benefits. Um, so, you know, it's kind of the early insurance company model basically. And um, that but, was very but, appealing. But, but on a cooperative basis. Right. I mean, people who would pay in, only people who paid in were eligible to receive um, support. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, she was very, you know, very driven woman of high integrity. Um, but the U.S. government was, um, U.S. government was, what's the right word? Um, furious, you know, incensed. Hostile. That, that hostile. You know, how dare 
she suggest that the federal government owed these enslaved people anything? Um, and then further, they said, you know, anyone who would suggest that the federal government would pay a pension to the black men and women who had served uh, or to the estates of those who had died was a charlatan. And that she and any of her acolytes must be um, con artists. And so they went after her on that basis uh, and eventually convicted her on mail fraud, you know, but they, although they were never able to, there's a fabulous book that you may have seen written by um, Mary Frances Berry. Uh, and it's an autobiography, a biography of Callie House. Um, um, My face is black is true. And um, I mean, it's an <clears throat> astonishing account of her life. Um, I mean, but she never promised that these things would be, you know, that the federal government would pay uh, a pension, the federal government would pay uh, its debt to black people. Uh, she was very clear saying, this is something we are asking for, something we are hoping for. We're making an appeal. Um, at one point she had proposed that the cotton that had been a uh, bales of cotton that had been confiscated from the Confederates during the war, but that was still being warehoused um, by United States Marshals, that the value of that cotton should be the basis of reparations. Um, but the U.S. government, you know, said, you know, how dare you, you know, try to to, um, to claim a right to that cotton, <laughs> you know, that that enslaved black people uh, grew, harvested and bailed. Um, but yes, it was quite, uh, she actually ended up going to jail for uh, one year. She served a year in prison uh, for her efforts. Uh, but but the, the movement did not die with her. Um, you know, uh, the Marcus chapters. The Garvey movement took it up, didn't it? Chapters, uh, chapters flourished across the country. Then, ne uh, then the next person of, of note is Marcus Garvey, uh, who has a similar model. Um, now, Garvey, though, was also proposing that, you know, black people's best bet was to um, to relocate to the continent of Africa, which is not part of Callie House's uh, agenda. agenda at all. Yeah. Um, but he, too, is eventually targeted by the United States government uh, for mail fraud uh, and was given the choice of going to jail or being deported back to Jamaica. And so he 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 chooses deportation. Um, but then you had, you know, uh, Audley Moore, who was a Garveyite. Uh, she's born in 1898 and uh, becomes kind of like the modern face of reparations in the United States in the 20th century. She, she's also so, known you know, as Queen Mother Moore. Queen Mother Audley Moore. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kirsten did uh, a, 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 a fabulous article about Queen Mother Audley Moore, what it's called, The Queen Mother. The Queen Mother. Yeah. In Vanity Fair, November 2022. So very recent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, fascinating woman, yeah. you know, um, black nationalist, rep reparations uh, advocate. Um, and she was not only influential, but, you know, understood the connection between um, the oppression of black people in the South in terms of wages, in terms of policing. Um, you know, she was very much uh, engaged, as was um, Ida B. Wells, uh, in looking at the, the so-called lynching claims uh, of white women against uh, black young black men across the South. Well, rape, rape uh, these rape charges, um, these rape charges that white women were making um, against black black young black men, um, and linking them to the lynching trail across the South. But she was also interested in, um, you know, looking at the paucity of jobs with any kind of growth potential for black people in the South, but also in the North. Um, but yeah, she was a very interesting, very interesting character. Um, you know, she was active in Louisiana uh, and very much active in uh, the state of New York. And then we she get was a Pan-Africanist, but yeah. her focus in terms of the reparations claim was specific to black Americans mm -hmm. whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States. That that's, that's who key. she felt were supposed to receive uh, redress from the United States government. 
in, in talking about reparations, and I thought you made a very important point earlier that reparations is not something that's new to the United States or even to governments around the world. They, they happen all the time. The United States have paid reparations, as you mentioned, to uh, Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II, as they should have been. I think most people would agree that they should have been paid reparations. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, when, when ideas of reparations come up, and I, I saw this especially here in California when it was first reported about this commission's draft proposals that haven't been officially released yet. Um, I, I did see a lot of people say we can't have reparations without, without also having reparations for Californian Indians, for, for native Californians. Um, because if you know, if you look at the history of the state of California, they, they lost as much as, as anyone had lost and also had a genocide conducted against them. How, how do you respond to the calls that if we're going to that that there should be reparations for for uh, African Americans. There should also be reparations for Native Americans. There's absolutely a, a very strong case uh, for Native Americans, uh, not just in California but across the United States, um, and we support those efforts. But that is not the case we're making. Um, you know, we are focused very narrowly on the, the case for true reparations for Black American sins of U.S. slavery. I think there's a lot to be learned, uh, uh, you know, in the two movements, and it's important to you know come together and talk about strategy, uh, and to talk about research methods. But the cases are different, um, and we think there's some danger involved in lumping them together, you know, kind of log rolling or piggybacking. What we have seen uh, when that kind of strategy is adopted is that both cases are diluted. Um, you know, it's really difficult, I think, for individuals to wrap themselves, wrap their brains around the details of both cases. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, focusing on one and, you know, uh, you know, giving your support to the other, we think is a more effective way to proceed. I think people are having a hard enough time trying to understand or appreciate the notion that reparations for black American descendants of U.S. slavery is not a case that's being made exclusively on the basis of slavery. Right. In fact, there is a whole historical record in the post-slavery period of atrocities that forge the racial wealth differential in this country that are critical to the case for, uh, for, for African American reparations. Uh, so then if you take the next step, which is to, to say, well, we're not only concerned about reparations for black American descendants of U.S. slavery, but for this group and that group and so forth, uh, it really, really, uh, distorts, yeah. distorts the argument. And, and I'll note that, you know, when other communities have received mm -hmm. reparations in the United States, including the Japanese American community, there was no significant overture towards saying, well, shouldn't black Americans get reparations at the same time? And, 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 and we don't think that that, that overture should have been made, uh, because it would have reduced the integrity of the distinct case or claim for reparations that the Japanese American community had. So you're Similarly, saying don't, reparations don't do that to us re either. Re re reparations have to be, you're, you're saying reparations have to be focused. Yes, yes absolutely. On very specific, very specific community specific. of eligibility. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if Sandy mentioned this uh, too, a bit earlier, but, you know, uh, for us, you know, when we're thinking about Native Americans uh, and reparations, you're talking about a case or that involves sovereignty, um, which is very different from what you know Black American descendants of U.S. slavery are seeking. Um, in in this instance, we're talking about full citizenship rights, which is very different from right. a sovereignty claim. So that's another distinction. Yeah, the, I think the, that is really the material important. Conditions the material conditions for, for full citizenship, citizenship yeah. for Black Americans of U.S. Yeah. slavery. Um, so there, there are not just nuances, but some huge differences, I think, that really come into play that get kind of diluted um, or just completely ignored when you lump these different groups together. William Darity, you, you are an economist, and I had read for 30 years. You, you were influenced by a, a book that you read 30 years ago uh, called The Wealth of Races uh, that ever since you have been trying to calculate 
how much you know what reparations should be for for black americans yes um and uh there's an article that kirsten and i did with marvin slaughter that was published last year uh called the cumulative cost of racism and the bill for reparations where we attempted to do a a, a a critical analysis of various ways in which you might calculate uh, the uh, the sum that is due as uh, as redress to Black American descendants of U.S. slavery, um, and uh, I think that there there are two fundamental approaches. Uh, one approach is to list, catalog, and enumerate all of the relevant harms and atrocities that have been imposed on a victimized community, find a way to assign a dollar value to each of those atrocities, and then uh, then add it up to come up with a, 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 total, a total bill for the account. Uh, that's one approach, the enumeration approach, which is essentially what the uh, California, California Reparations Task Force has settled on as the way in which they're attempting to uh, to address uh, the recommendations that they're going to make. Uh, the The second approach, though, is to try to find some single measure or indicator that captures essentially the combined effects of these atrocities in the present moment. And uh, and we've gravitated toward the latter because we think that there's insufficient information to uh, actually do the enumeration effectively. Uh, we also think that uh, many of the items that are placed on the list might not be relevant to the uh, the, the reparations claim that might be made by persons who are living today. So for example, uh, we have some excellent attempts at calculation of the cost of slavery to the persons who were enslaved. And the numbers get to be uh, extraordinarily high. Right. Uh, you know, ranging from $54 trillion to dollars, six yeah. quadrillion yeah. dollars. Uh, you know, for the time that was stolen from all of the individuals who were subjected to slavery in the United States. But uh, but we don't think that that is a bill that can be justifiably paid to those of us who are living descendants of the persons who are enslaved. And so what we need is a measure of the denied opportunities and economic security that confronts the folks who are living now as a consequence of the long-term effects of slavery and the atrocities in its aftermath. And so that's why we settle on the racial wealth gap as the primary indicator of the cumulative intergenerational effects of right. white supremacy on folks who are living now. And so we choose the second approach, which is to find this single measure that attempts to capture the combined effects of all of these harms. Uh, and so when we settle on the racial wealth gap as the as the as the uh, as the core uh, core mechanism for for measuring uh, the size of the reparations bill, we come up with a figure in the present moment of about 14 trillion dollars that is owed to the 40 million individuals who whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States and who are living as black Americans today. And only the American government could do $14 trillion. I mean, probably not, right. not in a single year. I mean, I imagine this would have to be over time. It could. could it, it could do I mean, it, it in a single year. Right, yeah. absolutely. And, and, and we recommend though, that it be done over no more, more than, than a decade. Yeah. No more than that. Certainly not 50 years, as yeah. some people are proposing with the California measure. Uh, and and we also say that if, uh, you know, uh, a legitimate concern might be 
the adverse inflationary effects of such an injection of funds into into the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, you could uh, distribute the funds in ways that are different from simple direct cash transfers. You could distribute the funds right. that took in, in a form in which they were less liquid assets. Right. It could be annuities, you know, a yeah. trust fund. Some type of some endowment. Some portfolio of, uh, of yeah. assets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the key thing is that the individual recipients should ultimately have full discretion over the use of the funds. They, they should get the funds. People should individually they get should the get funds. They should get the money. Yeah. yeah. It should not be channeled through some social program or some third party. You know, or or be converted to scholarships, for example. Uh, yeah, the scholarships. Um, well, you know, why not? Everyone. Yeah. Why? Well, I mean, so everyone is not, you know, looking to go to college or yeah. back to college um, or may or may not have relatives who they could, you know, give that money to if that was even allowed. Um, yeah. You know, this was not, you know, when Japanese Americans received uh, those uniform payments of $20,000, they didn't come with a, a caveat that said, okay, you can only use this money if you're going to, you know, go to a state school, uh, or you can only use this money if you're buying a house. And, and it wasn't put through social programs. Yeah. And it wasn't put through social programs. As no, well. no, no, it was, it was given, cash directly, to given directly to them. Yeah. And um, as, as it should have been, as it should have been. Yeah. And that work was done in about 18 months, yeah. beginning to end. And yeah. it was what, $10,000? Each person twenty thousand twenty thousand dollars nineteen eighty eight and nineteen eighty dollars, yeah. which is about what about forty three or so thousand dollars today, uh, something like that thirty eight to forty three thousand dollars, depending yeah, on how, which like, calculator how you, you use. Calculate. And people say, you know, twenty thousand dollars that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but you know, many of these families were um, farmers, and they had larger families. So, say you had four children, that's a family of six. Um, you know, you're talking in today's dollars, something closer to two forty to three hundred twenty twenty five thousand dollars. That's not insignificant for, you know, individuals who were incarcerated for four years. You know, four years. Um, you know, I'm not belittling the horrors that they were subjected to, but um, you know, people who say, "Well, that doesn't sound like a lot of money," need to really think about, you know, the conversion to today's currency. A. Kirsten Mullen and William A. Darity Jr. have been our guests. They've joined us for a conversation about reparations. They are the editors and contributors of a new book. It's called The Black Reparations Project, A Handbook for Racial Justice. William Darity, Kirsten Mullen, I've enjoyed that conversation very much. It was very educational, and I thank you both. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks much very much. Us.